morning and welcome on this uh, St. Patrick's Day and on this second Sunday um, in the season of Lent. About 16 years ago, a hiker named Aaron went on a solo hiking trip in Utah's Canyonlands National Park. Aaron didn't tell anyone where he was going, and he didn't have any way to communicate in case he got into trouble. As Aaron was descending into a slot canyon, a boulder dislodged and pinned his right hand between the boulder and the canyon wall, and Aaron spent five days trying to get his hand free. And if you saw the movie, 127 Hours, you know what Aaron had to do. That with a utility knife, he cut off his own hand, then rappelled down a 65-foot rock face with one hand, and then hiked himself out. Aaron Ralston's story is a rather dramatic example of a self-inflicted wilderness experience. By hiking solo and not telling anyone his itinerary, where he was going and when he was supposed to be back, by having no one to call for help, Aaron found himself in a life and death situation that could have been avoided. Well, last Sunday, we started our Lent series in the wilderness with God. And and in this series, we're looking at five wilderness stories from the Old Testament part of the Bible. You see, the wilderness isn't just part of the geography of the Bible. The wilderness is part of the geography of our lives and of our souls, The wilderness is a picture of those times in our lives when we find ourselves isolated and alone and questioning God and questioning the meaning of life and wondering where God is in our lives. And although Christians don't talk much about these kinds of wilderness experiences, Christians from the past actually talked about them quite openly. A couple of years ago, Mother Teresa's private letters were published And we discovered that she often experienced times in the wilderness when she felt forsaken by God. And many modern Christians read these letters and were shocked at these experiences. But Christians from past centuries would have just shrugged and said, well, of course, that's part of the Christian life. Last Sunday, we looked at the story of Hagar from Genesis. And we talked about those wilderness experiences that are caused by the choices of other people that thrust us into the wilderness. And if you didn't hear that message, I encourage you to check it out on our website or on our YouTube channel, because I think it was an important one, and we think about these wilderness experiences. Today we're going to talk about wilderness experiences that we bring upon ourselves, The ones that come from our own mistakes, our own bad decisions, and our own sins. Today we're going to look at the wilderness experience of Moses from the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus. And we're going to see some ways that God can work when we find ourselves in wilderness experiences that we ourselves have created through our own choices. So I'm going to invite you, if you're able, um, to stand with me as I read from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. This is the Word of God. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. 
The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh, to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. You can be seated. To understand this wilderness story, we need to go back a few hundred years. More than 400 years before Moses was born, the people of Israel have migrated from Palestine to Egypt in Africa. And they went to Egypt for refuge during a terrible famine that swept through the ancient Near East. The Egyptians welcomed Israel with open arms, inviting them into their land and inviting them to settle in the region of Goshen, which is on the eastern delta of the Nile River. But over time, the Egyptians went from being gracious hosts to cruel oppressors. And the people of Israel, over time, found themselves enslaved by the Egyptians and no one to turn to. The Egyptian king, traditionally called by his title, the Pharaoh, became concerned that Israel was getting too large. He was afraid that if Israel grew in population too much, that they would rise up and rebel against their slavery and rebel against Egypt. So the Pharaoh commanded the midwives of the Hebrews to kill every newborn baby boy that was born. But two of these midwives refused to carry out Moses' decree. So then the Pharaoh commanded that all Hebrew baby boys that could be found in every Hebrew household be thrown into the Nile River to drown. And it's in that context that a little baby boy from a nameless couple from the tribe of Levi was born. The baby's parents kept him hidden for as long as they could, about three months until they could hide him no longer. And in an act of desperation, this baby boy's mother puts her three-month-old in a papyrus basket and places it on the Nile River. She releases her baby boy to God, and as she and her daughter Miriam watch, as the basket floats downstream, facing all but certain death. But the baby is found by Pharaoh's own daughter. And she has compassion on this abandoned Hebrew baby. She saves him and adopts him as her own son. And it's Pharaoh's daughter that names this baby Moses. You see, Moses was originally an Egyptian name, not a Hebrew name. And although Moses is ethnically Hebrew, he's now legally and culturally Egyptian. And as the adopted daughter of the Pharaoh's, or the adopted son of Pharaoh's own daughter, Moses grows up in the palaces of Egypt amid wealth and privilege, far away from the plight of the Hebrews. Moses is culturally assimilated into Egypt. Egyptian name, Egyptian education, Egyptian culture, Egyptian identity. And we wonder what, if anything, Moses knew about his Hebrew heritage during these formative years growing up in the palaces of Egypt. But many years later, as an adult, Moses ventures out of the luxury of the palace to see the plight of the Hebrew slaves. By now, Moses has some awareness of his Hebrew heritage. 
And growing up in privilege in the palaces of Egypt, it's unlikely that he had ever seen the plight of the Hebrews firsthand with his own eyes. So he ventures out to see for himself. And as he sees how the Hebrews are being treated by the Egyptians, he's deeply outraged. So much so that when he sees an Egyptian abusing a Hebrew slave, something snaps within Moses. He goes into a rage and he beats the Egyptian to death. Afraid of what he's done and its consequences, Moses tries to cover up his crime by burying the Egyptian in the sand. The next day, as Moses ventures out among the slaves, he sees a Hebrew slave mistreating another Hebrew slave. And Moses tries to intervene. But as he tries to get them to stop, one of the Hebrew slaves says to Moses, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing us, killing me, as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? This would be the first of many, many times in Moses' life that his own Hebrew people would reject his leadership. And at the slave's words, Moses is terrified because he realizes that his action was not kept secret but has become known to others. And in fact, Pharaoh himself hears about Moses' violence and puts a bounty on his head. And so Moses runs for his life, far away from the Hebrews, far away from the Egyptians, into the land of Midian. Midian was a barren wilderness in northwest Arabian Peninsula. And in Midian, Moses encounters a Midianite family who welcome him into their home. Moses eventually marries a Midianite woman of that family named Zipporah, and they have a son, and Moses settles down among the Midianites. He becomes a a shepherd in Midian. And, And it's an easy detail to miss, but the Egyptians actually despised shepherds above every other occupation. The Egyptians looked down on shepherds so much so that they would refuse to even be in the same room with a shepherd. Moses ends up in an occupation that he grew up despising as a child. But Moses finds a home with the Midianites. And that's where our story could end. Until Moses' wilderness experience. And in our reading today from Exodus 3, Moses takes his sheep to graze at what the Hebrew text says is the far side of the wilderness. And the Hebrew text suggests that this is further into the wilderness than Moses has ever ventured before. That it's near Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. Mount Horeb is another name for Mount Sinai. The very very same mountain that Moses would later receive the Ten Commandments on the top of. And no one knows exactly where Mount Horeb is, but the traditional site that's everyone's best guess is a 7,497-foot peak in modern-day Syria called Jabal Musa. And just to give you a sense of Jabal Musa, it's a little higher than Mount Wilson, a little lower than Cucamonga Peak. And it's part of a deserty, barren mountain range composed of volcanic rock and granite with occasional acacia trees, thorn bushes, and shrubs. And deep in the wilderness, at the base of Mount Horeb, Moses sees a strange sight. A bush that's on fire, but that isn't consumed by the flames. In curiosity, mesmerized by this strange sight, Moses begins to draw closer. And as he does, the the angel of the Lord begins to call Moses from the flames. And so Moses draws still closer, probably more cautiously now, until finally God tells Moses to come no closer, to take off his sandals, that this barren, sandy dirt that he stands on, the very, the very ground his sheep are grazing on, has become holy ground, a holy temple. I think of the words of the great naturalist John Muir, who once said that between every two pine trees is a doorway to a new world. Only in Moses' case, it was likely two acacia trees that was a doorway to his encounter with God. 
God introduces himself to Moses, perhaps for the very first time. It's hard to know how much Moses would have known about the God of his ancestors at this point in his life. And so God introduces himself as the God of his father, his Hebrew father. And the God of his Hebrew forebears, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And once Moses realizes who God is, he becomes afraid. And he covers his face in fear. That curiosity has given way to holy reverence and worship in this holy space. You see, Moses had left his Hebrew heritage behind forever. But here, on the far side of the wilderness, it's caught up with him. God says that he too has seen the misery of the Hebrews. Just as Moses had seen And that God is going to do something about it. God is going to bring Israel out of their slavery into his own land. And God is going to use Moses to do it. God is going to send Moses back to Egypt. Back to the place he has run from. Back to where he killed a man in rage. Back to where he's a wanted man. Back to the place where his own people rejected him. And so Moses' response is predictable. Who am I? Who am I to do this? Moses feels unqualified, inadequate. But there's a deeper question. Who is Moses really? Is Moses a Hebrew even though he's never lived among the Hebrews? Is Moses an Egyptian, the the people he spent the first part of his life with, his name Egyptian? Is Moses a Midianite, the people he's married into and settled down with? Who is Moses indeed? If you keep reading in chapter 3 into chapter 4, you see that Moses argues with God, not once, not twice, but five different times of why he's not adequate for this task, but God calls him anyway. And Moses will go on to become the greatest liberator in Hebrew history. Moses was in a wilderness of his own making. His explosive rage, something that he would wrestle with throughout his life, led him to take another life. Moses went into the wilderness as a fugitive, rejected by his own people, hunted by the people who raised him. John Muir once said that for every person the wilderness harms, there are countless others the wilderness heals. And I think Moses would agree that the wilderness was part of his healing. Some of our wilderness experiences are of our own making. Let's be honest. Our lives are punctuated with regrets and failures that sometimes plunge us into wilderness experiences where we feel abandoned by God, derailed from life, with more questions and doubts than answers, a moral compromise, the betrayal of a friend, Harsh words that we can't take back. The decision to chase a foolish dream. The decision to run away from our responsibilities. A a lapse where we cave in to our worst impulses. These are the kinds of things that can take us to the far side of the wilderness. How can God meet us in these kinds of places? I think we can find at least four ways that God meets Moses that he can also meet us. First, in wilderness experiences of our own making, we begin to learn that our story is part of a bigger story. Our story is part of a bigger story, God's story. Each of our lives is like a story, and I'm the main character of my story. You're the main character of your story. And each of our stories have supporting characters, a setting, and action, and plot twists. If my story is like a book, then each part of my life is like a different chapter in that book. And there are chapters I wish I could rewrite. And I suspect you have chapters you wish you could rewrite as well. There are often parts of our stories that we don't like. Like. 
the parts of our stories that are filled with regrets and mistakes, crucial decisions made in an instant that led us down a path that we didn't want to go. But what if our stories are not separate books in and of themselves, but what if our stories are actually chapters in a larger book that has a bigger story to tell? What if some of the chapters that we wish we could rewrite, the chapters that we regret, actually contribute to this bigger story and make sense in light of that larger story? That's what Moses discovered in his wilderness. He discovered that his story was part of a larger story, the story of God, the story of God's people, the story of the God of his father, the story of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And in the wilderness of our own making, we can begin to discover that our story is part of something bigger as well. Second, in the wilderness of our own making, we begin to understand who we really are. We begin to understand our identity. Moses' question in, in Exodus 3.11, who am I, is really the, the same question that we all ask. Who am I really? I mean, the threads of Moses' identity were confusing. Hebrew, Egyptian, Midianite. Moses' question reminds me of the character Don Shirley from the film Green Book. Born to Jamaican immigrants to the U.S., Shirley's musical gifts insulated him in a world of affluence. And the way the film portrays it, Shirley was taken to, into Russia to the Leningrad Conservatory of Music as a child, far away from the plight of other black Americans in the U.S. at that period of time. And one of the themes of the film Green Book is Shirley's sense that he doesn't belong anywhere. Who am I, he wonders. Who am I really? There are probably threads in your own identity that are confusing and painful to you. Things about you that you wish you could hide, or maybe that you do hide, because you're not sure how to process them. I think of a young man I met a few years ago who was biracial, the, the son of a Korean father and a Japanese mother. And historically, Korea and Japan have often been enemies. And this young man felt like he had to, to hide half of his racial identity in order to find acceptance for the other half. And it deeply disturbed him. I know of other people who are raised in poverty but keep it a secret you would never know. I know people who've been to war and never talk about it. I have a friend whose Jewish mother changed her name and kept her Jewish heritage hidden from everyone for decades. It's often in the wilderness that we begin to face these parts of our identity. It's often in the wilderness that we begin to realize that the parts of who we are that confuse us and trouble us are part of who God made us to be. And that God wants these parts of us to emerge, to come out of the darkness and into the light of God's, God's redeeming love for him to sanctify and to use for his glory. Moses' identity as an ethnic Hebrew, an adopted Egyptian, and a Midianite in-law would be the very things that would uniquely qualify Moses to go into Egypt and to confront the Egyptians, to lead the Hebrews out of their slavery and to guide them through a 40-year period in the desert. God will use all of who Moses is, but first, Moses has to figure out who he is. And the wilderness helped him do that. Third, in the wilderness of our own making, God often takes us back to the beginning of our mistakes. God often takes us back Moses never wanted to go to Egypt again, the place where he'd lost his temper and killed a man in rage, the place where his own people rejected him and said, who made you ruler and judge over us? And yet that's exactly where God is taking him, back to the beginning. One of my psychology friends who teaches at APU calls these corrective experiences 
She says a corrective experience is, is an experience when we find ourselves in a similar circumstance that led to some of our past regrets and we have the opportunity to make different choices than we made back then. And that's what God does for Moses. And that's what God often does for us in the wilderness of our own making. He takes us back to the beginning. And finally, fourth, in the wilderness of our own making, we begin to discern God's purpose for our lives. We begin to discern that God has something for us to be and to do. Moses begins to discern discover God's purpose for him within God's story. That young man who had a Korean father and a Japanese mother went on to become a missionary in a little village in China that was entirely biracial. And his own identity, as painful and confusing it as, as it had been for many years, uniquely qualified him for his work in that village. God has a role for you in his story, that no one else can play. There's no one else in the world exactly like you. And there are things that God wants to do as part of this bigger story that only you are uniquely qualified to do. And all of who you are, the good stuff and the bad stuff, the successes and the regrets, a part of what God wants to use. In fact, we'll spend our entire life learning more and more about God's purpose for which he created us. And sometimes it takes a wilderness experience or two of our own creation for us to begin to discern that purpose and begin to lean into it and embrace it. We bring some wilderness experiences upon ourselves. None of us is perfect no matter what our social media pages might suggest or what we might try to portray. We are not perfect. We all make decisions that we regret. And sometimes those decisions take us to the far side of the wilderness. But God is right there with us, loving us, forgiving us, redeeming our mistakes, guiding us through the barrenness of the wilderness. And so if you're here today, and if you're in that kind of wilderness in your life today, I'm here to tell you that God is with you. I can't tell you how long that wilderness is going to last. I can't fix it. I can't make it end. But I can bear witness, as many, many people in this church can as well, as one who's gone through my own wilderness experiences, that God is with you, that you are forgiven. And that just as surely as God called to Moses from the burning bush, that God is calling to you, inviting you to see how your story is part of a bigger story. Inviting you to discover who you really are. Inviting you back to the beginning where it all started to make new choices. And inviting you to begin to discern why God made you and how you might live a life of purpose. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the story of Moses, an unlikely leader a man who is just as human and frail as we, a man of regrets, doubts, mistakes, and yet you called to him, you forgave him, and you used him. May it be so for us. And I pray especially for those who are in their own wilderness experiences that Glen Kirk would be a safe space for them to walk through that experience, to hear your voice, to experience your love, and to find forgiveness. We pray these things in Christ's name.